All right, so today we'll talk about Newton's second law. So firstly, I mentioned Newton's first law uh, in the last video you hopefully watched, um, which is known as the law of inertia. So I just wanted to briefly mention a little bit more about inertia. So inertia is the resistance of any object to a change in its state of motion. It is also a property of mass, so the more mass an object has, the more inertia it is. So a very common example of this is the tablecloth and um, table setting trick. Uh, so this person here, right, we've got these, um, these plates and this, this vase on top of a table. All right, so this person's very easy, it's easy for this person to change the motion of the tablecloth um, because the table plus is, is light, lightweight and he's directly acting on it too. But um, we see that the plates here, well, they want to remain where they are, right? They're still and they want to remain still. Uh, this is a property of the fact that they have inertia. Where this vase has a little less inertia than these plates because it has less mass. And there's a little more physics going on too, but that's kind of the general gist of it. So we see here that the tablecloth is able to move the vase more easily than it is these plates because the plates have more inertia than the vase. All right. So in the, the lab you all did, um, you should have found, you have come up with the conclusion that ex um, acceleration is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass. Right? So just as a reminder, acceleration here is a vector quantity, force is a vector quantity, where mass here is a scalar quantity, meaning it does not have direction. Um, and actually, you can see in this formula why it's literally called a scalar, because mass is going to scale the value of the force. Um, but anyway, our experiment was a bit limited, because we analyzed the application of just one force, Right, you're able to change the force that was applied to the block and, and nothing else. Um, so we just analyzed a single force acting on an object. Now we could have done more experimentation where we had multiple applied forces acting on the block. And what we had found is that acceleration is determined by the net force acting on it. And so what do I mean by net force? So net force is the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. So it's the total amount of force. We just have to be careful when we think of the word sum in total because we're dealing with a vector quantity. So we have to deal with adding them vectorally. Uh, but on the, nonetheless, um, net force just means the total amount of force. So if there are multiple forces acting on an object, that's going to affect the motion of the object. So I want to talk about the word equilibrium. Um, so you may have, uh, be familiar with this word from, from chemistry class, and that's great. We have a similar kind of definition here. Um, so what we're referring to specifically force is. So when there's no net force acting on an object, it is in equilibrium. All right, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, about what that means later. But we can actually subcategorize equilibrium. We can have static equilibrium, and that's when our object is not moving and staying not moving. And we could also have dynamic equilibrium. So that means our object's moving with a constant speed. So this, so equilibrium is going to occur when net force is zero. And what's interesting is net force being zero implies that there's no acceleration, since the formula we had there, acceleration is force over mass. Uh, if we have no net force, then acceleration will have to be zero. So when it comes to uh, force, uh, we have, let's see, rearranging the equation, force is mass times acceleration. We've got mass that has units of kilograms, and we multiply that by acceleration, which has units of meters per second squared. So one unit of force is going to have a, a unit of kilograms times meters per, over second squared. Now this is kind of cumbersome to write, um, so we actually redefine this quantity of kilogram times meter over second squared as one newton. And we're going to abbreviate that as just the capital N. So what this inherently means and implies is that one newton of force is the amount of force that causes a one kilogram mass to accelerate at the value of one meters per second squared. That's literally what it means. Um, 
Just kind of as a side note, a newton is a secondary unit. Um, so that means it's made up of uh, primary units, which are kilograms, meters, and seconds. So when it comes to forces, typical objects are going to range to the amount of 0.01 newtons to about 10,000 newtons. So if you're trying to figure out if your answer seems reasonable, we have a, quite a range of, of that. Um, but something to help us check and kind of see if something an answer seems reasonable would be to, to convert um, to a system we're more familiar with, being the English system, so a pound. So one pound is about 4.45 newtons. Um, so we can kind of do a quick estimate here. Um, we can say that one pound is about five newtons, just for rounding. Right, so you can do a little a little math there to see if your answer seems reasonable. Right, so if you have uh, you find an answer to be you know five mil five hundred, we'll say uh, newtons, but you have that being the uh, you find that force is the force of let's say a, a penny. You know your answer is wrong. Um, now something to be careful with: uh, pound is a measure of force. It's not a measure of mass. This can be pretty confusing because our everyday language kind of confuses the idea of mass and weight, right? A lot of times you'll hear, oh, someone says, oh, I weigh, you know, such and such, and such kilograms. Um, that's actually a value for mass, not for weight. There are two distinct things. Um, so mass is how much matter makes up an object, where weight is, well, actually, it's the force due to gravity acting on an object. And we'll talk more about that later. But... I just want to kind of drill that into you now. So for dealing with, um, you know, our SI units, so we've got mass, our, t our uh, unit's going to be kilograms, and weight is newtons. Now, for our English unit, weight is pounds, and the equivalent unit for mass is actually called a slug. And yes, I did have to look that up. <laughs> All right, so let's look at some situations here in which we're going to compute the net force. So we have three different kind of situations here. So for our first one, we've got, let's say, a, a block. And there are three forces acting on this block. Right? We've got normal force upward, gravitational force downward, and friction force leftward. So what this is basically saying is that we've got this block sitting on some sort of surface. Because remember, um, normal force means that we have um, a force that's normal to a surface, right? mathematically normal. So perpendicular. Uh, but nonetheless, looking at this, it's going to be simplest and convenient to us to kind of break up thinking about net force into horizontal and vertical and kind of do them separately. So for example here, we have two forces acting vertically. We've got normal force up, gravitational force down. So these forces are actually going to cancel out because if we set up a coordinate system, being a little pedantic about this, calling upward as positive, our normal force has a value of positive 40 newtons and gravitational being negative 40 newtons. So vertically, we have no net force. Horizontally, we have a net force of 10 newtons leftward. Remember, we need to indicate direction. So overall, we have nothing vertically and force leftward, so our net force in total here is going to be 10 newtons leftward. Our second situation here, we only have an upward normal force and a downward gravitational force. So these are going to cancel out, leaving us with zero net force acting on this block. And finally, we have a situation in which we have air resistance upward and gravitational force downward. Uh, we have 40 newtons upward, 25 newtons downward. So this means we end up with a net force of 15 newtons upward. Right, so don't forget to indicate direction. If a problem states find the magnitude of the net force, that means you do not have to worry about your final answer having direction in it. Um, where if it just says calculate net force, you should include direction just in case the problem is implicitly asking for it. Better to be safe than sorry. All right, so we have a pretty interesting question here. So we've got, again, forces acting on blocks. We don't know the names of these forces, but these, these vector arrows here are just representing um, the forces and relative magnitudes. So if we have, let's say, an E, a longer arrow means 
because it has more strength to it than the force here depicted by the smaller area. But uh, my question here is which of these objects have a net force acting to the right? So the answer to this is C. So object A has no net force. Same thing with object B. Object C has a net force to the right. Object D has a net force to the left. And E also has a net force to the left. So in every single situation here, it looks like our vertical uh, forces cancel out with each other, which is pretty interesting. So I do want to give a formal definition for Newton's second law, right? So Newton's second law says if we have an object that has some mass m um, and it's subjected to um, forces, so we can list it as, let's say, f1, f2, f3, for however many forces are acting on it, this object will undergo an acceleration dictated by this formula. So we have that our acceleration is net force divided by mass. Right, and a lot of times you might want to rearrange this and write net force is mass times acceleration. So what's important here is we're dealing with net force. Right? That word net is very, very important. Um, if you forget, if I ask you to write to state Newton's second law, and you forget if you just say, oh, F equals MA, that's Newton's second law. Nope. Net force is mass times acceleration. It's an important distinction, so I'm really going to, to grill you on it. Uh, but nonetheless, net force here is the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. Um, so what's interesting is what this formula implies is that the direction of the acceleration is the same direction of the net force. Right? That's very important. Um, that's that's going to be the case. Uh, so basically, we have nothing. So acceleration is in a certain direction. Um, we have nothing on the, the right-hand side that's going to change the direction or affect direction, right? If we, so then net force has to be in the same direction as acceleration. Um, so that makes it really easy because if we know the direction of the net force acting on the object, we immediately know the direction of the acceleration and vice versa. Um, what's also important about this formula is that um, acceleration is directly proportional to net force and inversely proportional to mass. So a couple quick things I wanted to mention here. So a lot of times we write this as net forces mass times acceleration. We'll often use this in practice. Uh, we may also write net force as uh, using the summation symbol that I introduced at the beginning here. Right? You can be a little bit more mathematically rigorous and write um, using the Greek letter sigma as the sum of. So just a couple quick things to be careful with. Right, so when we have multiple forces acting on an object, don't just think that the biggest force is going to overcome all the other forces. It, all the forces come into effect uh, to determine whatever the acceleration is. Um, also, the m involved here, mass, is something to be. It's something called inertial mass. This is kind of more of a fun fact. Um, so this is the mass that an object resists to being accelerated by a force. Um, the converse to this would be gravitational mass, which is basically mass involved by some other formula we'll learn later this year. But basically, we, there's, no math, there's no practical difference between mass. Mass is just mass. Um, it's just in theory, mass can have different definitions. It just ends up being experimentally mass is the same. Um, all right, so just a very quick example here. If we have a net force of 45 newtons and an object, this object then accelerates at 8 meters per second squared, what must the mass of the object be? So if we're dealing with net force's mass times acceleration, we can rearrange and state then that mass is net force divided by acceleration. So if we take our 45 newtons, divide by our 8 meters per second squared, and I believe that gives us 5.6 um, in the units that are going to be kilograms. 